We'll be looking at a lot of scripture today, but um, starting with um, Psalms 19, uh, verse 1, <clears throat> a beautiful chapter, one of the most beautiful chapters um, in the Psalms. So the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. This uh, beautiful description of God's majestic and marvelous and amazing creation um, is tied in also with his written word as well. Because just a few verses later, in verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the hearts. And the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Uh, a beautiful connection. And um, the title today is really The Glory of God in His, in his Works, Creative Works, and in uh, His Word. Again, before we get into the scriptures, let us pray. Heavenly Father, please guide and direct as we contemplate your greatness, your goodness, and your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. God speaks in many different ways to his children uh, through visions and dreams, audible word, the written word through the wonders of creation, and through the incarnation, of course, of Jesus Christ, the ultimate revelation. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, God, who at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Almost a thousand years before King David wrote uh, the Psalms is the story of Job. And um, as you know in your Bible, Job, the book of Job is placed right next to the book of Psalms. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. But there's almost a thousand years time difference between Job and Psalms. And in your Bible, in the Old Testament particularly, it's, as you may have discovered, it's not chronological, although the first five books of Moses are relatively chronological for the most part in Joshua and Judges. But then the, the books of the Old Testament are, are grouped by categories. And you have your major prophets and your minor prophets and, and um, uh, the wisdom literature, which is considered Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, Song of Solomon. Uh, and so you have these, these different groups. And so it's not a direct timeline um, at all. And for some, that seems to be uh, quite, uh, quite confusing. Um, but one of the blessings is that as knowledge has increased as God promised it would. Uh, we've learned more about the ancient scriptures and, of course, with the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, being discovered back in, I believe it was the 50s. Um, suddenly, we could go back a thousand years further to earlier manuscripts. Now, the Bible didn't change. It just confirmed that the Bible is true. But uh, all of that has been such a blessing um, and also the research that's being done on the time in which the, the prophets of God, the writers of the Bible, lived uh, in their contribution. Um, but Job is believed by the Bible researchers, and there's evidence for it, um, to be the oldest book in the Bible. And certainly one of the oldest stories in the Bible. Um, 
coming from the patriarchal period. And based on the age that we don't know, the age of Job at the time of uh, the story begins, when it begins and all the trouble that falls upon him. But we do know that he lives a long period afterwards, another 160 years. So he probably lives at least 200 years. So this definitely places him about the time of Abraham, maybe just a little bit before. Um, Also, it's possible to conclude, and I think quite reasonably, that because in the book of Job no reference is made to the other patriarchs like Abraham, no reference is made to the Jacob or the children of Israel. And so this would reasonably place it uh, about the time of Abraham, probably just before. Um, and so the question arises, um, why would this be the first you might say, written communication. And I personally believe it was written many years later by Moses. But why would this be the very first message that is given to the human family in writing? Now, obviously, uh, the story of creation and, and the flood and all of that's been handed down from generation to generation and then, of course, recounted and and uh, put into to writing by Moses. But why would this this story be the very first thing that God commissions into writing for his human family. We uh, are going to, to be looking at that, um, and I think we'll find, we'll find some answers. But as you, as you well know, uh, God declares that there was none like Job as far as being upright, faithful, um, avoiding evil, serving God. And he also, as the book of Job says, uh, he was the greatest man in the East. Um, Now, he says he lived uh, in the land of Uz. Uz does not show up on the maps today. Um, But the the researchers indicate, and there's some indication even from the book of Lamentations, that um, apparently this was southeast in the area of Edom, southeast of the Dead Sea, which would also be in the northern region of northern Arabia. So, but obviously it was it was in the east. Um, interesting enough, in the book of Job, it also, he uses the term, there's a number of terms for God in the Bible, but the, the one he uses is El Shaddai. Um, and so it's, it's used more by in the book of Job than almost anywhere else in the Bible. Um, so these are interesting to set the context for what's happening. But um, as we know from the very first chapter of Job, that apparently there is a discussion going on in heaven, and uh, Satan is out to attack Job's character. And there we see, uh, in there's um, verse 6, it says, It was the day when, chapter 1, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan was among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? He said, From going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. And then the Lord immediately says, Have you considered my servant Job? So Satan basically said, I now represent this earth. I'm the Lord of this earth. I'm the undisputed ruler. But God says, wait a minute. I got somebody that loves and serves me that is not bought into your lies. Um, And of course, Satan says, well, he only serves you because you've been good to him. You know, he's wealthy. He's, you know, everything going for him. Um, there's got to be a reason. There's got to be a, a, a motivation. And um, then in verse 10, or 9 rather, Satan says to the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? 
If it were not for the hedge of God, I believe that all of God's followers on earth would at least would probably be dead or close to it. Because that would be Satan's desire. He wants to destroy everything good. He wants to destroy anybody who's trying to follow God. And we see what happens when God allows his hand to be moved back for a few minutes. And very quickly, uh, Job loses everything, his wealth, his servants, his family, animals, and, and his family with the exception of his wife. And almost lost her spiritually because she says, curse God and die. Just curse God and die. Forget it. The next 36 chapters of Job are a search for the big question of life. Why God? Why? It was believed then, and and even 2,000 years later, at the time of Christ, that every tragedy that happened was sent by God as a specific punishment for a specific sin. They did not understand that a lot of things happen simply because we're in a broken world and because sin is here because of the fall. And, and so they thought, surely only good things could happen to good people and only bad things should happen to bad people. But the insight given to us in the book of Job is that Satan is the instigator of all trouble, of all evil. God is still in charge. But that things do happen. Bad things happen to good people. And sometimes it seems that temporarily what we think are good things happen to bad people. The disciples, you remember, asked Jesus about the man who was born blind. They asked uh, in in John chapter 9, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? It's kind of an unusual question unless you believe in original sin. How could this poor man at the moment of birth have already sinned when apparently his blindness occurred in the womb? So it couldn't. But Jesus didn't get into that uh, part of it. He said, oh, well, if it couldn't have been him, it must have been his parents. Something happened. What happened? And Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed. And, of course, shortly thereafter, Jesus would heal this man um, of his blindness from birth. And you remember in the story that um, they got hauled into the religious court trying to make him, you know, who did this? Who did it? What had happened? You know, they kept grilling him, and then they went after his parents. What happened? The parents were scared. They said, well, uh, he's of age. We don't know. You ask him. Um, They were so frightened of being excommunicated that they didn't say anything. Um, But you remember as they quizzed him, finally this dear man says, this one thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I see. God apparently permitted that tragedy of blindness to happen for his glory, and for this testimony that that man gave. In Romans 8.28, of course, Romans 8 is really the Mount Everest of of Paul's writings. Um, In the 8.28, in the King James, all things work together for good uh, to those who love God. Beautiful promise. Um, In the Greek transliteration, it's even stronger um, and more beautiful. It says, and we know that to the ones loving God, all things he works, that is God, he works together for good. And a lot of the Bibles is beautiful, but it's it's rather passive. Here in the Greek, it's actually very active. uh, That God is, is deliberately orchestrating permitting, guiding, and it doesn't say that all things are good. 
It just simply says that God is at work for those who love him for a great and ultimate good glory. For his glory, but also for our good. Um, As we learn very quickly in the first two chapters of, of Job, he's sad, he's discouraged, he wishes he could die. And uh, he has three friends, you remember, that show up to comfort him. Well, he calls them his miserable comfort- comforters <laughs> because they are sure that he has a terrible hidden sin. Otherwise, this couldn't happen. So the next 36 chapters, they're trying to basically get him to confess. Fess up, Job. Fess up, Job. Fess up. Tell us what you did. Got to be a reason. Tough enough with all that was happening, had to happen to Job. And then to have someone, we'll have three someones, placing the guilt trip on you. Um, But nevertheless, Job, in his trust of God, not understanding what's going on, in fact, as far as we know, Job never finds out. Job does not find out what's going on. Not unless it got revealed later, but it's not revealed in Scripture, whether God told him what was going on in heaven and that this was a a test um, of character to bring hope and courage uh, to the world for thousands of years. Um, But you remember the the passage where, uh, I think in the second chapter, I believe, where it says, uh, Naked I came... From the mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Unspeakable tragedy. But yet somehow, Job knew that he had not been forgotten by God. That somehow, it was not God's fault. And he continued to trust. Uh, And it says, In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. And as we, as as you go through, and of course, there's the conversation back and forth, and they take turns talking, and a lot of it's about God's greatness, God's goodness, um, and his justice. And the whole question of of suffering. the uh, the sovereignty of God a lot of a lot of talk about the sovereignty of God. Um, one of the challenges that people face today in the modern world, and particularly the secular world, is how can there be a bad world and a good God? I mean that's a big issue, and they think well. Either God is impotent and weak, or if he's all-powerful, he doesn't care, or he doesn't exist. But the Bible shows another beautiful pathway that, yes, God exists. We're in a broken world. He's got a plan of salvation, and he's got an ultimate uh, plan for our rescue, rescue of anybody willing to... uh, to follow, to follow Jesus. Um, and that, yes, things are terrible. And according to the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, it's going to get worse before it gets better, before Jesus comes. It's going to be much more difficult. Um, I remember learning about some years ago about a, um, a man who lost... Uh, I think three children in an automobile wreck, automobile accident. And he was a believer. And his reaction was quoting the book of Job. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, And you think, wow, what hope and courage and faith. They're not blaming God. That's what Satan does. He wants people to blame God. That's what Job's wife did, was blaming God. 
but that God permitted it because we're in a broken world. And nevertheless, God is still in charge. And then in Job uh, chapter 13, verse 15, uh, as, as Job is struggling through all this emotional turmoil, and you remember, not only did he lose almost all of his family and his wealth and his animals and his servants, shortly afterwards, because he was still faithful, Satan complains and he loses his health. He's covered in boils. And he's got nothing left except the wife that says, curse God and die. But then in verse 15 in chapter 13, Job says so beautifully, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And even so, I will defend my own ways before him. And their understanding, particularly in the Old Testament, was that everything would, you know, came from God. They were still learning that this war was going on between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. And yes, God does permit. But Job was saying, no matter what happens, I choose to trust. I choose to believe. And then in Job 19, another beautiful passage where his faith shines through, uh, verses uh, 25 to 27. Job says, For I know my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another, and how my heart yearns within me. And so already Job has a vision, a perspective of not only the first coming, of Jesus as a redeemer, but of the second coming of Christ coming back to rescue his people of the resurrection. And this concept of a redeemer comes down to the patriarchal line, uh, obviously from the book of Genesis, or I should say from the story of, of Adam and Eve recorded in the book of Genesis, where the promise is given of a Messiah, of an anointed one who would come and eventually would destroy uh, all evil. Well, as the uh, the conversation uh, continues, uh, and then finally the Lord shows up. It's just a thing about when the Lord shows up. Have you ever noticed when you're saying, Lord, 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 I need help, you know, I need guidance, I need direction, please, you know, help me. The Lord has a way of showing up, at least from our perspective, at the last possible moment. <laughs> um, some years ago, there was a, was a young man up, in the, up north who um, was a son of a pastor. But he was tired of playing church. And... Um, he said, yeah, is this just religion thing? Is it real? Is God real? I mean, what difference does it make? But he wanted to find out. He really wanted to find out. He was honest, but um, wasn't sure. So he made a bargain with God. He said that um, he would be willing to seek and search God by studying the Bible diligently every morning for 30 days. So if I remember, I remember uh, hearing him tell the story. Uh, and I think it was a half hour, but he would spend time faithfully every morning, first thing, studying the Bible. And he said, Lord, I will do this for 30 days. And if you don't show up and let me know you're real, I'm out of here. I'm gone. Adios. Bye-bye. Guess which day the Lord showed up? Day 30. And suddenly he sensed God's presence and realized that, yes, God is real. And he cared about him and was willing to accept this bargain, if you will. You remember a lot of people in the Bible made these, you might say, little bargains with God. 
wasn't it Gideon that asked for signs, you know, the fleece thing? And whoop, wait a minute, Lord, I got that backwards. Let me switch the, you know, the story around and get it the other way. Uh, and bless God's heart, he deals with human beings, and he honored uh, this young man. Of course, he became very involved, very dedicated to the Lord, and uh, turned out that he was very, very gifted in music, in art, in craftsmanship. I mean, anything his hand touched, it was amazing, this young man. But he dedicated all of his talents to God. And he's decided, he said, listen, he said, it's really very easy. It's if God gives anybody any talent, then if somebody notices that gift, this is all you have to do is point the eyes up and say, hey, this, this, this gift is on loan. You remember there was somebody in the Reddit used to say that uh, his, his was talent on loan from God. Um, well, it's true, very, very true. And so we just point people to God. And um, so God shows up and then does this amazing tour of creation. Doesn't answer the why questions, amazingly. Um, but does this astronomy thing, biology, just the whole nine yards. Uh, amazing to run out. He says he answered out of the whirlwind. Since God loves color and action, I personally think, don't have a Bible text for it, but I think Job got an audiovisual of this tour of creation. As, as he sees, and finally Job says, and you remember what God asked, oh, uh, who determined the measurements of the earth, the foundation? Were you there? Who stretched the line on it? Who laid the cornerstone? Where were the morning stars sang together? Who's the, who has, uh, has the reign of Father? And the drops of dew are begotten. The frost of heaven, who gives it birth? Who can you bind the cluster of Pleiades? You number the clouds by wisdom. Um, and uh, he asks all these questions, of course, that Job can't answer. But basically pointing out his, his greatness, his majesty, and his trustworthiness. Um, in chapter 42, Job answers the Lord and says, these things are too wonderful for me. I think that's verse um, 3 of chapter 42. I, because, therefore, I uttered things which I did not understand. He's questioning God, but he says, God, I'll trust you. I still don't understand, but I will trust you. Um, with whatever happens. And then Job says something very beautiful. He said, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear. He had received the audible, oral word of God, handed down. But he says, now my eye sees you. And I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Um, in other words, he realizes his humility. You remember when Daniel caught a vision and when the other prophets of God would actually get a vision of God. They would sense his presence. They were never proud. They were always humbled and said, Lord, we're unworthy, but we're thankful for your greatness. We're thankful for your goodness. And I wanted to share just a couple of things that in, in nature, God's creation, that are so amazing. Uh, Read just a few lines here from this book on creation, and I'm going to have David show a five-minute segment about astronomy, uh, which is so magnificent, telling us of God's greatness. Um, this one is about the about the eye. The part of the body that really bothered Darwin when he was constructing the theory of evolution was the eye. He said, "This is a problem." And he didn't know one hundredth of what we know now about the eye. But he knew it was very complex. And he said, this is a real problem. You know, how could this happen, uh, you know, by accident? Well, what we now know, um, just in one aspect of it, is that um, when a baby is conceived in the mother's womb, the genetic DNA code governing the eye programs the baby's bodies to begin growing optic nerves simultaneously from both the optic center of the brain and from the eye. 
a million microscopic optic nerves begin growing from the eye through the flesh toward the optical section of the baby's brain. Simultaneously, a million optic nerves with a protective sheath similar to fiber optic cable been growing through the flesh toward the baby's eye. So you got two things happening from the eye and the brain. A million nerves both approaching each other. And each one of these one million optic nerves must find and match up precisely with its mate to enable vision to occur. That is no accident. That is the power of God. And to think that evolutionists know about this, but they choose to believe a fable rather than to believe the word of God. Um, just amazing what we've discovered with the telescope and with the microscope. Um, and now I'd like to share this, this five-minute selection. And this question is, how many stars... Here's a question that could literally keep you awake all night. How many stars are there in the universe? On a clear evening in the desert, without a telescope, we can see about 5,000 individual stars. All of them are located in the Milky Way, a fairly typical spiral galaxy with a stellar population somewhere between 100 billion and 400 billion stars. And the Milky Way is just a speck in the observable universe, where estimates range from 100 billion to perhaps as many as 2 trillion total galaxies. Now, let's do the math. Using conservative estimates, we'll multiply 100 billion galaxies times 10 billion stars per galaxy. The product is a whopping 1 billion trillion stars. And remember, that's a low-end estimation. To appreciate a number that large, we need some context. So let's try this. There are roughly 135,000 grains in one cubic inch of sand and about 235 million in a cubic foot. While exact measurements are nearly impossible to determine, geographers estimate there are approximately 220,000 miles of coastline and 6 million square miles of sand desert on the surface of our planet. Using estimates like these, Researchers at the University of Hawaii have calculated that in all the deserts and beaches of the world, there are something like seven and a half times 10 to the 18th power, or more than seven billion billion individual grains of sand. Again, an estimate like this is an educated guess. So to make some allowance for the difficulty of actually counting sand, let's increase the Hawaiian calculation by a factor of 10. Now that'll build you a lot of castles, but it's only a fraction of the total number of stars. Because when we compare the estimates of total sand to total stars, the stars outnumber the sand grains by at least 10 to 1. But that may not be the most amazing part of this story. You see, a single grain of sand, four one hundredths of an inch in diameter, contains approximately 500 billion billion individual atoms. That's more atoms in one grain than total grains of sand on the Earth, or stars in a billion Milky Way galaxies. Okay, before we power down our calculators, here's a final dose of big numbers. In a single drop of water, there are about 1.7 billion trillion individual H2O molecules. 
That means in just a few large drops, the total number of molecules could exceed the total number of stars in the entire universe. So, what's our takeaway from these mathematical excursions into the basic structure of creation? Well, for starters, we live on a planet that's part of a cosmos unimaginably large and complex. And that planet is filled with countless atomic and molecular universes, inconceivably small and often even more complex. And each of these physical realms, gigantic or microscopic, is held together every second of every hour of every day by the God who created everything. Remember that next time you're searching for scarab beetles in the Sahara Desert. Or camping in South America under the breathtaking glow of the Milky Way. Or just hanging out in the backyard, watching your wet dog launch 10,000 liquid universes on a summer afternoon. It's amazing. Maybe, uh, maybe Job got to see something like that uh, in his tour of, of creation. And um, we stand amazed as did Job. He didn't get the answers to the why questions, but he got evidence sufficient that he could trust his Creator. Even as we have plenty of evidence, overwhelming evidence, that we can trust our Creator to be with us, to guide us, to care. Um, even through the tribulation and trial of life, as the psalmist David would say, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Thou art with me. That is the promise that has been given to us. This life is often very, very confusing. Beautiful poem, Master Weaver's Plan, my life is but a weaving between the Lord and me. I may not choose the colors. He knows what they should be. For he can view the pattern upon the upper side, while I can see only on this, the underside. Sometimes he weaves in sorrow, which seems so strange to me. But I can trust his judgment and work on faithfully. Tis he who fills the shuttle. He knows what is best, so I shall weave in earnest and leave to him the rest. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly shall God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needed in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. One of my favorite Bible commentators wrote the following. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. Again, amplifying the promise in Romans 8.28 that all things God works together for those who love him. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Heavenly Father, we stand in awe of your creation and of your recreation, your marvelous plan of salvation. And Lord, we choose, like Job, to trust you no matter what happens, because we believe in the end you will keep your promise to never leave us nor forsake us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.